calls you and me. Well, if you got a copy of your Bible, turn to John chapter number 6. John chapter number 6 this morning. Appreciate you uh, standing, honoring God's Word. I'm going to do a little work on it this, this morning. I'm going to have you turn to three different places. Uh, if you have a bookmark or a little ribbon and ribbony ribbon thing on your Bible, I don't know what they call those things, a little black thing in the middle there, uh, you can... We're going to, I'm going to go to three different places, so you can place, uh, and there's a reason for this. Uh, I joked earlier, Andrew Chadwell says, whenever I preach, you ought to pack a lunch. And so uh, I'm trying not to make you too late for uh, dinner today. So uh, put, put, put it right there, put a marker, something in there. Uh, John chapter number 6, I'll give you the verses here in just a little bit. And I'd go to the book of Psalms chapter 51. Psalms chapter 51 after that. Uh, take your time. I'm getting there, I just want you to see these verses. There's certain verses in my text or in our, our preaching today that I would love for you to see. I'll quote some, but I want, want you to see certain ones. I'm just going to have you already there so uh, you can stay on the text and then uh, we'll flip uh, back and forth and go back to our text this morning. So uh, Psalm 51, you got John 6 marked, John f- and then uh, I, uh, Psalm 51, and then... Uh, I know you're like, what in the world? Uh, bring a, a piece of paper. Uh, Dave McCracken likes to say, if you don't got a bookmarker, just tear the maps out of the back. You don't use those anyway, right? <laughs> just tear one of those out and put it right there. You say, you're tearing the Bible. No, you're not. It's the maps. You know, they don't. And then go to Jeremiah chapter 6, okay? Jeremiah chapter 6. That's where our text will be. We'll do our, our preaching out of that. Uh, I like preaching time. I like singing. I like praising God. Oh, how he loves you and me. Come on. Oh, oh, how he loves you and me. That song, his grace so free washes over me. Man, if you've never experienced the grace of Jesus Christ wash over you, you're missing it. You need it. That's why we're here. The grace so free washes over me. Whew. I'm going to preach another message before I get into the message. But Jeremiah chapter number 6, read you verse 10 through 17. Read verse 10 through 17. Jeremiah 6, verse number 10, the word of God says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of the young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together, for I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Looks pretty bleak right there, doesn't it? Watch this. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Our great God in heaven, we do thank you. We can bow again one more time before your holy presence. Thank you, dear God, for the ability to talk to you, the mighty God of heaven. We give you reverence and honor and praise for the Son, Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice on the cross. Thank you that your grace is so free. It washes over us. 
not, not of any works that we have done, but according to thy grace, you have saved us. Praise you, O God. And today we want to exalt the name of Jesus and also the word of God. We're asking that you would speak to us, that you teach us something. I'm praying that, Lord, you would uh, just tug on a heart maybe that's unconverted, unsaved. They don't know Jesus personally. God, would you convict them of their sin today? Praying that you'd encourage Christians, edify us as a church. And God, we need you. I admit that. You know my, weak, my weaknesses, my faults, and my failures. God, I need unction and power to preach your word today. Would you anoint your servant and then anoint your people, O oh Lord, their minds and their hearts, that the seed that is sown today would land in good soil and bring forth 30, 60, 100 fold in our lives. I believe the word when it says it's quick and it's powerful, it'll do the work. And in the end, God will be very careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory from what's said and done in this room today. Your name be magnified in that holy and that awesome, that precious, and that powerful name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. You be seated. Thank you for standing on God's word. And we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. We're broken. Sin is broken and continues to break families, relationships, churches, and even the children of God. Because we live in this broken world, it will bring forth broken people. Look around the world and the distresses of nations, the things that are going on. If you watch too much news, man, it'll just, I don't watch it. I, I tell people I just want to punch a wall and I can't control myself and walls are harder than my fists. You know, so I, I stay away from them. I like unbroken bones and so I, I don't watch it. But man, if you you look and you uh, acknowledge and you, you see some of the things that are going on in our world. They're, it's broken, and because it is broken, it will produce broken people. The stress of life may get to you. The fear of death may get to you. The worry of money may get to you. It will break you. The distress of situations, the depression of the future. We, uh, we don't know the future, but we know who holds the future. We know that, but yet... The weight of all this coming down on us, the weight of, of the broken world, it will cause us to be broken. It's something that happens consistently in our world. And there's family struggles. There's personal struggles. There's money struggles. There's sin struggles. Come on now. I, this ain't the first righteous Baptist church. This is Bible Baptist church. So there's sin struggles. And we got them. We we struggle in a broken world. It is broken. And when all these struggles come up on us, it weighs on us and it pushes us down. We break and we are broken. The, a broken world produces broken people. We see people all the time as man sat in the office yesterday and just wept over his broken life. 24 years old, weeping in front of a guy he's never met. Why? A broken world. Sin has broken this world and it breaks people. We get broken. Now, that sounds terrible to be broken. You think, I don't want to be broken. That's, that's not something that wants to happen. But I, I want to show you the comfort knowing that a brokenness is not something that's necessarily bad in the economy of God. you got Psalm 51. Hold your place here. Don't lose it. Go to Psalm 51 and watch these verses. As we look at a brokenness that happens almost consistently in our world, and especially as we see the days of Christ when to return, it says uh, men's hearts failing for fear, looking unto the signs of the heavens and all these things that are, that are happening that kind of point to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And though we look and we consider and we think, oh, man, I can't wait to see him. Yet in this broken world, there's sometimes we get broken and we think, what do we do when things get broken? And uh, Psalm 51, verse 17, an amazing verse. Watch this. After David had sinned with Bathsheba and Nathan had pointed him out and said, uh, you're the man. You need to, to get right with God. And, and what's amazing, I preached on this last Wednesday, uh, just Nathan. And do you realize that because Nathan did what God told him to do, that David is still living? If he wouldn't have went to him and said, you are the man, and David wouldn't have repented of his sin, this is what Nathan said in those verses, uh, you're not going to die now. And that just put in my mind that if Nathan wouldn't have said, hey, I'm going to do what God told me to do. Okay, wait, 
This is a side note. Sorry, I'm preaching another message. Okay, if David, if Nathan would have done what he would have done, he spared the life of the greatest king Israel has known. He didn't die because Nathan said, I'm going to go do what God has told me to do. Even if it cost me my life, he pointed him and said, you're the man. And so David, after that, and he was pointed out, he wrote this psalm. Look at verse 17. He says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Amazing. Watch. A broken and contrite heart, oh God, thou would not despise. God says this, that I delight in a broken heart. I delight, I take pleasure, I do not despise those that will come to me broken, and the word says contrite. What's that mean? The word contrite means broken. Kind of seems redundant. Broken and broken? Yeah. Because here's what I think happens in my mind and in yours. Here's what happens in the church of the living God in 2022 is that we are broken before God. And true, the Bible says this in Psalm 139, verse 14. He says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That fearfully doesn't mean that God, when he made me, said, oh, man, that guy's awesome. I mean, he might have said that. No, I'm just joking. I'm saying, come on, trying to loosen you up a little bit. He didn't look at it and say, oh, oh my goodness. No, no, no. It means that when he put us together, every single cell within our body, and he knows every one of them, was put there on purpose. That he, he, he molded us and he put us as, as, a, as a puzzle together to make us a wonderful creature for his sake. But what happens in the midst of a broken society, in the midst of a broken world, in the midst of, of the sin that does so easily beset us, that we start to put ourselves together the way God never intended and we get broken so that God can put us back together. Because I want to tell you, God is in the fixing business. And so when he says this, watch, he says, a broken and contrite, a broken and a broken heart, is that we get broken in some areas. And we say, God, we need fixed. I need fixed. This area of my life needs fixed. And God says, well, what about that area of your life? Well, I kind of leave that alone right now. I'm not really having struggles with that one. He says, no, no, no. You need to be broken and broken heart. A broken, he said, I won't despise that. And he wants us to be broken completely. Why? Because we put ourselves together the wrong way. The years in this, and the, the broken world that we live in, we have tried to put ourselves together, and that's why there's family struggles. God made the family perfect. I, if we follow his ways, his path, hey, that's a perfect way. He'll get it done. But we have tried and, and we've, we've tried to, to piece things together and make them the way we want. And he said brokenness is something he doesn't despise. Uh, Isaiah chapter 57 says this, and I'll just read it so you don't have to turn there. Or if you can find it, you can turn there. But Psalm 57, or Psalm, Isaiah 57 verse 15 says this. Listen, he says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, hallelujah, I dwell, the hallelujah was, my, my, I said that, I dwell in the high and holy place. Watch this. He says, I'm dwelling in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. That is a broken and humble spirit. I'm going to dwell with those guys. Look at, or listen, it says this, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. You see, God in his sovereignty, in his awesomeness, God is in the fixing business. He wants to fix the brokenness of this world. He wants to fix your brokenness and my brokenness, and in these, regardless of how broken you are. There's no way he'll do this with me. You know, there's no way, after all that I've done, after all that I've seen, after all the sin that I've committed, how can God do something with me? Because he is in the fixing business. He wants to fix that which is broken. He wants to do it. And he, not only does he want to fix that which is broken, but when he fixes something, brother, it gets fixed. Woo, it gets fixed. I have to go, woo, because none of you else are doing it, man. I just say, woo, there it is. But, <laughs> sorry. But he is in that fixing. And so watch this. It says in, in Psalm 51, said, it's a sacrifice to be broken to God. That he doesn't despise it. Amazing, Isaiah 57 says he dwells with them. What? To revive that humble spirit. To revive those contrite ones. He wants to make us alive again. He says this, I'm going to revive their spirit. There's going to be suddenly a kick in their step. There's going to be something different about them because I've taken that which was broken and I've made it alive again. And then he says this, I'm going to revive their heart. That's your purpose. 
that he's going to take your very purpose, that which the world cannot take away when you lose your job, that which the world cannot take away when someone dies, that which the world cannot take away when something happens that you don't, wasn't expecting, you think, oh, my purpose is gone. No, no, no. The purpose that God gives and he makes alive in your life, that he revives within you when you come to him broken, is that which can never be taken away from the child of God. And that's why we point people to Jesus. I can't give you that purpose. I can be like, hey, you want to paint something? And you'd be like, sure. And I give you the paint and be like, okay, I'm not doing that. I don't want to paint the side of this building. I don't want, I, you think my purpose is gone. Will gave it to me. Yeah, I know it'll be gone. But when God gives you something that can never be taken from you, hallelujah. He puts together broken pieces. But as we see in our text, if you go back to, to if you turn, go back to Jeremiah chapter six. In Jeremiah's day, the people in Jeremiah's day God wanted to fix, but they weren't being broken. They weren't uh, allowing themselves to be broken before God. Because watch this. One of the, um, the sovereignty of God is he will allow you to stay in the state you're in as long as you're willing to stay in that state. He isn't going to force himself. I remember hearing a preacher say this. Uh, Jesus is a gentleman. He will not enter where he is not welcome. That's why you find him at the door knocking. Amen. Come on now. That's why he's at the door knocking. I mean, I just think, Jesus, you're God. Why don't you just be like, boom, I'm going to bust that bad boy. He don't do that. Why? He's a gentleman. He will not go and he will not break your free will. And so watch this. If you don't want to be broken, he won't break you. He won't. And so these people in Jeremiah's day, oh, mercy, watch this. They were not broken. Why? What? They, they, God wanted to fix them, but they were not broken. Now, if you know the timeline of all this, Jeremiah... About the, the timeline of Josiah, you kind of look at some of the kings. They weren't quite into captivity yet, but they were getting ready to be. Their, their evil, wicked sister uh, Israel was already taken away. Judah and Benjamin were left. God sent Jeremiah, hey, you guys, you're going to be taken. He's trying to get them to understand that even though things are going pretty good, even though things aren't exactly bad yet, man, God wanted to fix a problem. But they wouldn't get broken. I want to show you five things why you won't be, or I won't be broken from the children of Israel. Watch this. Number one, look at verse number 10. We wouldn't be broken because they had a hearing problem. They had a hearing problem. You say, well, I got my, I got the things in the day, my hearing aid. I got them in the day, and I saw the hearing problem. Look at verse 10. To whom shall I speak? This is God talking to the people. Listen. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach and have no delight in it. They had a hearing problem. Oh, they were listening. Oh, Jeremiah was preaching, but they just didn't get it. It said that his ears were uncircumcised. That means they still had the fleshly desire to hear only what they wanted to hear. That if you're not tickling my ears, if you're not giving me that which I want to hear, I'm just shutting off. I'm not doing anything. He said, I'm preaching at them. Look at the end of verse 10. He said, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They had no delight in it. It amazes me. It absolutely amazes me. I guess not amazes me, but I, I, the, the, I will we'll, we'll sit in a service and uh, or we'll sit in front of a TV for two and a half hours and not budge. We'll squirm and oh, I don't want to miss this part. We're so excited and enamored with the things on the TV and, and, and some of the movies that come that capture our attention. But when we come into the house of God, somehow we get distracted and pulled away by that little thing. And hey, guys, listen to me. I'm HDAD child. I'm squirrel guy, man. <clears throat> I, I, I kid you not. I'm like, was there a fly over there just flying? You know, I, that, that's, that's me. I pull myself away. But you know what I did a long time ago? I said, if I can't get excited about the word of God, there is something wrong with me outside of when the word of God's being preached. That we have a competition, us preachers do, because we are trying to compete with Hollywood and all the explosions. And we'll sit in two, two and a half hours, we'll sit in front of a TV. Come on now, take the halos off. We will sit in front, two and a half hours in front of a TV and go, Woo, that's awesome, that's so great. Then get into church service. Uh, what happened? Then in delight in the word of the Lord. No delight in it. That's what it says. They had a hearing problem. That somehow we've missed that God wants to speak to us through preaching. You say, well, I don't like the way this preaching thinks. I didn't make it up. God made it up. He said, I'm, I've, I've, I've chosen the foolish things of the world and found the wise. I've chosen the, the foolishness of preaching to save them that don't believe. That's God's design, not mine. But they have a hearing problem. That's why they won't be fixed. That's why they won't be broken. It's because they have a hearing problem. Number two, there's a heretic prophets. Look at verse number 13. Y'all look at your Bible. Watch it. It says, from the, east, the least of them... 
even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness, and from the prophet, oh my, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. There's heretic prophets. There's people standing behind the holy desk, the sacred desk, the pulpits of America or the pulpits of those days, and they were preaching heresy. They were preaching the wrong thing. They were taking a hold of or their opinions or a book, and they were saying, oh, everything's fine, and they would not be broken. The children of Israel would not be broken because there was heretic prophets preaching that which is false, it says, from the highest even to the least. And man, I'm going to tell you, the more I see Churches, uh, and, and listen, I said this early service, Bible Baptist Church, we all got problems. Come on now, we're all, yeah, I mean, you got problems, you're looking at probably the biggest one right here, right? I, I, I'm not, we're not beyond the problems in our church, and by no means are we a perfect church. If we're a perfect church, don't join it, you'll mess it up. No, I'm just joking, that was, that was a bad joke, but if we're, we're not perfect, but I'm going to tell you, as long as uh, there's breath in our preacher's lungs, because I know his heart, as long as there's breath in my lungs, the word of God will be preached. We won't take an opinion and say, well, this is what it says. And, well, I know it says that in there, but that really means in another translation this. Oh, no, no, no. We're going to take the word of God. We're going to stand on it because that's the only way that we won't be a heretic in front of God. And there's all around the country, people taking the word of God and saying, you can't really trust it. You can't really, it, may, it, may, it needs to be twisted this way and that way. I'm telling you, there's heretic prophets that cause the children of Israel not to be broken before God so they can be fixed. Not only did they have hearing problems and heretic prophets, but number five, they had half peace. This is amazing. Look at verse 13, 14. Look at verse 14. This is amazing. They have healed So God says they have healed, so there's some healing going on. Watch. Also, the hurt of the daughter of my people, but what's that word right there? Slightly. (laughs) Wow. But watch what he says. Saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. What is he saying right there? Here's what I'm saying. Watch. He's saying that because these heretic prophets are standing up and they're preaching falsehoods, because they're preaching that which is not holy and just in my word, that he's saying, hey, everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. That some people in the pews are going, oh, I'm glad he said that. That just feels good for him to say that because I'm really worried about that. And all the times God's saying, no, there's no peace. What are you doing? It gave them a half peace. The Bible says slightly. Now, I would like to slightly pay my mortgage. <laughs> Come on now. I'd like to... I'd like to uh, slightly, if I ever get pulled over for speeding, uh, officer, I was just slightly going. There's no slightly. He said, there's no peace. There's no peace. You can say it all you want. You can trick your mind and all you want. But God said, there is no peace. And when God says there is no peace, there may be someone say, it's going to be okay. But what does God say? There's a half peace. Because the heretics were crying, everything is okay. They had a little easement in their life. They got a little bit more comfortable. They never would get broken so God could fix them. Number four, there's holiness was protested. Holiness was protested. Look at verse number 15. Look at your Bible. Watch it. It says, they, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay. Now, that's not a horse. Ah, sorry. I said it like that. sounded like a horse, man. Uh, or no. Watch. They were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. God said, uh, when they committed abomination, things that I wouldn't even, they wouldn't even blush at it. That somehow that this is okay. Holiness was not expected. That I I, I don't really need holiness, even though the Bible says, uh, be ye holy for I am holy. And somehow they, they missed over that holiness was to be expected. No, it was protested. That I will do this regardless of what someone says or doesn't say. I'm going to do this, and I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I'm going to post it all over social media. I'm going to tell my friends that I'm this and I'm this. And then God says, it is an abomination. And he said, you will not be broken so that I can, be fi- I can fix you because you expected holiness and you protested holiness, and it is expected by God that we be holy. 2022, I am not ever, ever afraid. That's why I don't have a social media account. I don't have one. I almost got one the other day, and I thought, this ain't going to turn out good, man. If I get it, and people are going to get on here. Because I'm going to tell you this, in 2022, Christians ought not be posting things that are unholy. Christians ought not be cussing and chewing. and, and they, they, There ought to be a separation of holiness 
that God expects out of your people. Do we sin? Of course we sin. But we should not flaunt it and say, I'm not ashamed of this. Look at me. And God says, it's an abomination. And because, it, you, because you and I have these tendencies in, the, in this broken society, that we won't be broken before God because we won't be ashamed of the sin that does so easily beset us. There's no shame in it in our day. Woe them that call evil good and good evil, Isaiah says. And that the world we live in where if we're doing good and we're trying to be good and trying to do all these things that God told us to do. God, I'm not commissioned by government to preach the gospel or to have church. I'm commissioned by God to. Therefore, only God is going to shut this thing down. Oh, come on. Only God's going to shut this thing down. And so I, you say, well, what about uh, Romans 13? I, I know all that, and I'm getting all sidetracked. Quit distracting me. I'm trying to, to preach the message, but you all distracting me a little bit. Okay, I, I, don't know, but I know that I'm going to follow God. Whatever God says is sin, I'm going, to, I'm going to say is sin. Whatever God says is good and right to do, I'm going to keep doing because it's good and right to do. That I can't be ashamed of the gospel. I can't be, but I need to be ashamed about my sin. They had no shame, no brokenness. Holiness was protested. Number five, humbleness was pushed away. Look at verse 16. Look at the end of it. He says, but they said, we will not walk therein. He gave him a solution. He's like, we're not going to do that. Look at the end of verse 17. But they said, we will not hearken. See, humbleness is required for you and I to be broken before God. You cannot and I cannot come before a holy God with a puffed up chest and saying, I'll do this thing my way. God says, no, 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 no. You and I need to be humble. And if we don't take ourselves and park our pride, we'll never get to a place where humbleness and a brokenness comes because we're humble. Because we say, God, man, just be honest before him. And, um, and you know me. And I just need to be broken before you. And I, I got pride in me as, as our friend, um, oh man, his name slipped my mind. Uh, Purden, Mike Purden, he said this, I'm just a proud man trying to be humble. And if, if we don't in some way park our pride, I don't care if you're young or old, I don't care if meek and bold, we all got a pride problem. And I, I love the altar, and I, I, we're going to preach on this in a little bit, but I, I love it because it, um, people, oh well, man, what sin did he do? Well, do you want me to name him? If I come down and kneel at an altar? He's walking down the altar. Man, he must have sinned this week. Yeah, which time? Come on now. There's got to be some, and humbleness was pushed away. They said, God said, here's what you need to do to get right. Here's what you need to do to be fixed. Israel, I love you as a nation. I want you to be fixed. Here's what you need to do. And they're like, we're not going to do it. Well, I'm going to send a watchman to blow a trumpet before you get destroyed. I don't want you to be destroyed. Israel, listen to me. We're not going to do that. And man, every preacher, uh, we talked last week after he preached, and there was someone unsaved in a a service. We knew they weren't saved. They confessed to be not saved. And he called me and said, Will, how in the world can they not just come and get saved? I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. And then pride. Stay in your seat. How can I not get right with God? Pride. How can I not be closer to him? Pride. God says, I'm calling out to you. I want you to be right. I, I, you got to be broken. I want to fix you. You put yourself together. Opposite of what I've wanted you to put yourself together. So when you break, oh, I want to put you back and make you what you're supposed to be in me. I don't want that. It's pride. Humbleness is pushed away. There's hearing problems, heretic prophets, there's half peace. Holiness was protested and humbleness was pushed away. So in the midst of this rebellious people, God sends a prophet that doesn't tickle their ear, doesn't tell them what they want to hear, doesn't woo them and try to get them to to build a bigger following. No, he sends a prophet, Jeremiah, that just flat out preaches at them to get them to a broken state. And what does he tell them to get to a broken state? Look at verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, what does God do? What does he tell people to get to where we're a broken state so we can be put back? I mean, Bible Baptist Church, how many of you want to get put back together the way you're supposed to be? Amen? How many of you want to say, oh, man, I don't, I, I'm living for myself so long, and I've, I've done all these things for my, myself so long, and, man, there's a purpose I know beyond this, but, I, man, I want to walk according to his precepts. Man, I want to do something for Jesus Christ that is in me to do. Jesus said, oh, I can help you do that. 
God says, oh, yes, I've got a way. In verse 16, he says, thus saith the Lord. Amongst all this, he's, he's preaching now. And you see that? I read those verses, that bleak picture, all this fury of the Lord. I mean, that's what it says. The fury of the Lord has come upon them. That sounds pretty scary. And then he says in verse 16, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and seek and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein and ye shall find rest for your souls. You see that? In the midst of all this, in the midst of him saying, hey, you won't hearken unto me. You got hearing problems. You got heretic prophets hanging around there. You got all these humbleness and you're pushing it away. You're doing all these things in the midst of it. He goes, thus saith the Lord. Hey, guys, I'm still calling. Hey, Israel, I still want you to come. He says this, you need to stand in the old paths. Stand in the old ways. You will find rest un unto your souls. You say, why the old paths? And the title of the message is, it still works. The old way still works. The old way still works. You see, what we've got in our mindset, pay attention to this now, is that we've got a new age. We say a new age. Well, with a new age, we think that there needs to become new things. There needs to come a new way to reach the, the, the uh, teenager. They say, well, uh, I went to a, a teenage meeting uh, where they, they got together some um, youth groups. And I remember this went to a church. And they got to they say, well, let's, let's do this youth group thing. And they got together and they started talking about all this new age stuff and all this thing. And I, I, catch me, hear my heart on this because I was not, I, I had a heart for this. I've got a heart for teenagers, been doing it for 17 years. So I got a heart for teenagers. I wouldn't do it for 17 years if I didn't have a heart for them. They made me have a tick, man. I mean, they, they, they do. But I didn't have a heart for them. I, I, it, it would it'd drive me crazy. But watch, I had a heart for them. And they stood in there and I, and I raised my hand. They said, anybody got anything to say? And I raised my hand. I said, what happened to just fasting and praying for your kids? What happened to just saying, hey, you just need to, hey, let's get the Bible out and read it. How about, what happened to ever preaching about them about sin? Last time I went to a, not last time, but one time I went to, they, they asked me to come preach at a, at a teenage, um, just kind of revival or teenage, it was an all-day thing. They said, well, would you come and preach? I preached salvation, the first message, and I started preaching to them about holiness and uh, piercings and all these things. And um, there's a guy came and took them out and all this stuff, and and uh, afterwards, the, the, the uh, youth group, the youth leaders got together and they're like, you were kind of awful in that second message. I'm like, what are you talking about? Oh, well, you know, you just kind of, you hit it and, you know, do you really need to? I said, holiness is still in the Bible. We're not supposed to live like the world. We're not supposed to look like the world. Contrary to what some uh, YouTube preachers preach. So, uh, listen, so, that some, contrary to what some people may think to gather a crowd, God still says, be ye holy, for I am holy. I said, what are you talking about? They never asked me back. That's okay with me. <laughs> I'm like, what happened to the old ways? Hey, we're going to preach on sin. Sorry. You say, well, I don't like that. Well, there's a bunch of tickling ear churches somewhere. We're just going to preach the Bible. The old ways, hey, they still work. They still work. Well, not working on me, probably because you're not humble. I wish I could make that cricket noise. That'd be pretty cool right now. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like an alarm clock. But look at, look at, look at, go, you're in you're Jeremiah 6. Go to Jeremiah 42. Hold your place here. Go to Jeremiah 42. Let me show you something. You say, well, this new way, these new ways, I get it. But I'm going to tell you this, that there's an old way and they still work. Jer Jer Jeremiah 42 Watch this, verse number three. <clears throat> Jeremiah 42, verse three. Now you still got John 6. I'm going to turn you there in a second. Jeremiah 42, verse number three says, Over, uh, Jeremiah, I'm, why did I, I, I went to Ezekiel. Sorry, I'm like, that is not the right verse. Look at verse three. These are the, uh, the exceptional people in Israel, the leaders over Israel, the leaders over the, the people of God. And they come to Jeremiah and they said, That the Lord may show us. The way wherein may, we may walk. Now, verse 2 says, we want you, Jeremiah, to go and beseech us for the Lord. We want you to go talk to us for God. We want you to tell us what he says because we want to know what God has to say. And verse 3 says, so that we may walk in this way and the thing that we may do. And Jeremiah, he talks to him a little bit. Look at verse number 5. They said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. If we do not, even according to all things for which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom, we send, to whom we send thee, that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. Now listen to me. Here's what he says. 
Jeremiah, you tell us what God says. When you tell us what God says, whether it's good in our eyes, whether it's evil in our eyes, whether it's good or right, we're going to do it because we love the Lord. So this is what Jeremiah did. For the next 7 through 22, he preaches at him and tells him what God tells him. He said, here's what God's telling me. This is what you need to do. Now look at chapter 43, verse number 2. I'm always amazed at this. I, every time I read Jeremiah, I'm like, wow. Oh, we'll do what God says for us to do no matter if we think it's evil or not. Look at verse 2. Then spake Azariah, the son of Hoshiah, and Jonaniah, the son of Kiriah. I don't know if that's how you pronounce all those, but if not, I just did. And the, all the proud men, saying to Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. <laughs> Did y'all see what he just did there? We're going to do whatever the Lord says. Jeremiah's like, This is what the Lord says. And they were like, No, he didn't. Yeah, I know. That's what I do every time I read. I'm alive. I'm like, What? You just said a chapter back, you're going to do whatever God says. What happened? They said, There's a new way we can do. I don't like what God said to do, so we're going to invent a new way because our new way is better than what God's old way says. And see, we have captured this new way in our minds that somehow we have to have something new. When we were back in the old building, we had a concert, I think a sold-out concert, and there was two teenagers that came in, and they were kind of being disruptive, so preachers like, take them out. And so I took them out, and they were sitting down with them, and I'm like, you guys need to get saved. They weren't saved. You guys need to get saved. And they're like, oh, we got to see something first. I'm like, what do you want to see? And they're like, we'd like to see that chair move and float in the air. Then we'll get saved. I'm like, no, you won't. Oh, yeah, we will. I go, no, you won't, because then you'll see that chair float, and you'll go, oh, but we want to see something else. See, the next day, they'll wake up, and they'll go, Jesus, I'm not going to follow you unless I see something else. What are they doing? They're creating a new way. And when we create a new way, what we're saying is the old way is broken. I'm telling you, the old way is not broken. It still works. It still works. And Jeremiah, he had this problem, but Jesus had this problem too. Go to John chapter 6. You already got it. You already got it. Look at John chapter 6. <clears throat> you got it marked. I'll just give you this a little bit, and I'll get to the message. Okay. So you're like, uh, man, I should have came to early service. You know, they, they got me off now. Message is simple, promise. Okay, John chapter tw or John chapter six. They didn't like the old way. What about this this new this New Testament? Look at chapter six, verse twenty five. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence comest thou hither? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. Watch this. He said, you're not seeking me because of the, the miracles, the things that I'm doing to show you that I am God, that I am this Messiah, that I am this Holy One, that I am the one that God promised would come. You're not seeking me because of the old ways. You found a new way to seek me, and that's because I feed you bread. That's because I'm feeding your flesh. That's because what I'm doing is making your flesh happy. And Jesus said, I never came to make the flesh happy. I've told you to crucify the flesh. That's what I've told you to do. The old way. Look at chapter, uh, look at verse 28. It says, and they said unto him, what shall we do? We might work the works of God. He said, well, what is it then that works? Here's what he said. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. He said, just believe on me. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shall be saved. The old way. Just believe. No, no, no. We need more. That's what they said. Look at verse 30. They said, uh, they said, therefore unto him, what sign showest thou then? You see that? G Jesus said, just worry about the old ways, the old paths. They still work. And they're like, no, no, no. We need to see a sign. We need, we need a new thing, Jesus. I mean, the son of God <laughs> on earth, they're standing in front of him, watching miracles, watching him prove that he's God. And they say, we got to just do more. <laughs> you got to show a sign or something. Show, show, show something new. He's like, no, just believe. And look, look at that. Look at verse 30. It says, what sign shows thou then that we may see and believe that what work, uh, what, what dost thou work? Our fathers, look at verse 31, did eat manna in the desert as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're like, uh, we need something to eat. And Jesus said, you're missing the point of that manna stuff. See, the manna, yes, it fed them in Israel, but God said the manna wasn't there necessarily to feed the flesh. It did feed them. It did sustain them. But it was there to picture who I am because I am. He goes on to say, I am the bread of heaven. I've come down that they might, not, that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. But man, I, I want to live 80 years. Great, but where are you going to live after the 80 years is done? See, Jesus is like, you got to get past this flesh thing. This, the, the new age is 
feed my flesh that the spirit may thrive. God said, no, no, no. The old way is I'll go correct the spirit and then your, thresh, your flesh will thrive. Not in a sinful way, but they, Jesus said, I've come to give life and give it more abundantly. And so we've got this concept that a new way is a better way. God says, uh-uh, the old ways are better. But haven't we seen massive changes because of COVID? Now, some, I, I, I mean, I get all the stuff. I, my wife is a hand sanitizer guy. I used to be a plumber. And we would get done doing plumbing stuff, and I'd be like, or farmer too, man. We, we'd, we'd be all out in the farm. My kids were out there the other day and never really been on a farm. We went to my old farm, and we're walking around. They're like, man, I don't want to step in those cow patties. You know, they're all worried about it. I'm tromping around it. I mean, I'm just, that's the guy I am. But I know that I'm supposed to wash my hands. I'm not belittling it, y'all. Just listen to me. They, they were like preaching it on every news channel. I'm like, duh. I mean, did anybody else think, yeah, I know, I'm supposed to do it. When you're sick, stay home. I get that, right? I'm like, what's new about that? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? I mean, I know there's some people, but they didn't, still didn't stop, even though they said it. People still were like, ah, oh, just go outside, you know, here, everybody. <clears throat> you're like, what are you doing, man? Get back inside. Get back and go. We get, but there was massive changes. There was things that we thought would never happen. But I'm going to tell you, even through massive changes, the old way still works. You say, well, what about church and, uh, man, or do things different? I don't think we do anything different. God didn't tell us to do anything different because the old way still work. They still work. But what if this happens? I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to tell you, if it happens, the old way still work. It still works. It still works. The world's changing, you know, it's always going to. But in the midst of broken world, in the midst of your brokenness or mine, when we're fighting over sin completely, when we're trying to keep our family together, when we've got more a month at the end of our money, when money problems come, when stress comes, when distress comes, when health problems come, when all these things come, and we think, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? God, what's going on? He's going to say, hey, I'm going to tell you, the old paths still work. They still work. Just follow them and do them. You don't need a new way. I don't need a new way. It's the old ways and they still work. So what still works? The old way. See, the new ones will leave us wanting, but the old ways, they'll bring us satisfaction. Psalm 145 says he opens his hand and satisfies the soul of every living creature. That's the God I know and the God I want you to know. But his old ways still work. War problems? Pff, you kidding me? Country problems, wowzer. Even in the midst of all that, church, the old ways still work. They still work. So what's the old ways? Here's your message. Ready? Seven simple points. I told my wife that this morning. She's like, oof. You know, <laughs> ah, you know, what are you doing? They'll be quick, I promise. Number one, ready? You want to know what still works? Tribulation still works. So tribulation? That didn't sound fun. I know, but... Luke 15, and we'll turn you there. There's a son that said, give me my goods that I may go to a far country and spend it all. Did the money bring him back? Did someone say, does the, does the scripture say that a preacher came to him and preached at him and that brought him back? You know what brought him back? Tribulation in his life. He's eating with the hogs and he goes, what's wrong with me? Because tribulation still works. 9-11, 2001. What's happened? My, my company, I work for a dog food factory. They, held out, they handed out free T-shirts that said, God bless America on it. My company. I'm like, and I went to church for the first time in years because tribulation. I just plead, don't wait till then. But I'm going to tell you, ready? It still works. God will see, you say, why, is our, why does God send all this stuff on our country? Maybe because we won't turn to him until he does. Why does God do all these things and allow all these things to happen? Because he's trying to draw him to himself. Two ladies at Kroger, I kid you not, in the same day. I'm walking in Kroger. One stops me. They don't have a preacher. They say, what about all this stuff that's going on in the world? What do you think it is? I say, I don't know. Walk down a little bit, and the lady's like, hey, uh, Will. She didn't hear the other lady. She says, what do you think about all this stuff? What's going to happen? You know, what, the end of the world and all this? I go, I don't know, but I know this. God's trying to draw you to him. Through it all, God's trying to draw you through him. You say, man, things are tough right now. Man, I don't know what to do. God is trying to draw you. Why? Because the old paths still work and tribulation still works. Just don't wait to come to him for that to happen. 
Number two, truth still works. Truth still works. John 18, you're in John 6. Go to John 18 real quick. As you're turning there, Hebrews chapter 4 says this, The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing sunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus said this in John 17, 17, Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. I'm telling you, this Bible, you may say, well, man, it's old. I get it. You may think it is. It, where it was written was old. But I'm telling you, this scripture still works today. It still applies today. It still pricks hearts today. I'm not responsible for changing people. I'm responsible for taking the word, sowing it, and then your heart has to receive it. But it still works. You can still read it. You can still preach it. You can still teach it. You can still take it into your job site. You can still take it to your family. And you can read it out loud, and it will still do the job it's supposed to do. Isaiah, God says, my word will not return void. All you have to do is throw it down and let it do its work. I'm not going to get you to do anything for God, but God's word will prick you to do it. It'll do its work. John 18, verse 37, Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of truth heareth my voice. He says, I'm going to tell you this. When the word of God is spoken, man, you hear his voice. One person said this. I can't take credit. I wish I could. It's an awesome quote. He says, if you want to hear God speak, read the word. If you want to hear him speak out loud, read it out loud. That's how you get it. I want to hear God's audible voice. Then read it out loud. You'll hear God's audible voice. It sounds a lot like yours, but you'll read it. You'll, you'll hear it. It still works. Truth still works. It still works. You see, the, the Bible, is it outdated? Absolutely not. It predates today. You ever been Revelation? Come on. Jesus, it predates today. It is not an old book. It still works. Why? The old past still works. It still works. Tribulation, truth, number three, the temple still works. Now, I'm talking about the church, but I needed a T. Oh, come on, y'all. I mean, you know, the temple still works. The church, the people. Aren't you glad you're sitting beside people? Now, don't shake your head no if you, <laughs> no, you're not. No way, man. You see the guy I'm sitting beside? The church still works, guys. Church, it still works. To gather on the Lord's Day on Sunday and come and praise his name and say, your grace so free washes over me. Oh, how he loves you and me. The praises, he inhabits the praises of his people to come in the house of God and hear a guy stand behind and spit and scream and do all that. Preaching, it still works. Let me tell you this, baptism still works. So get in, that, get in the water, you even baptized. I filled the baptistry up because I think someone needs to get baptized. You say, did you have anybody plant? No, but if you need to get baptized... I'll put waiters on or I won't put them on. I'll get in there just in my suit. That'd be great. I'll do it. Why? Because it still works. The Lord's Supper still works. That's why we still observe it. Hey, the altar still works. It still works. It's okay to come and weep. It's okay to come and say, this is a loss. God, I need you. And you say, why the altar? Because it's a place of sacrifice. You are forgetting who's around you. You are forgetting who's behind you or in front of you. You say, God, I've got to do business with you. And I could do it at my seat. But am I doing it at my seat? Instead, I want to fall at your knees and weep. I want tears. The altar still works for health reasons, for unsaved loved ones, for whatever. The altar still works. It still works. That's why we we'll always have it. We're going to have altar calls every single time the pulpit is preached at. Every single time. See, so what if no one comes? That's your business, but the altar still works because it's, it's an old path. It still works. Come on now. The temple still works. The truth still works. Tribulation still works. Number four, your testimony still works. It still works. Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The testimony of the Lord makes wise the simple. Psalm 51 says, uh, David in his, in his sin said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free will, it says. And it says this, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. What happened? He lost his testimony and he said, God, I need it back. Why? Because then that's when the power of God shows through us. Yes, it matters what you say. Yes, it matters what your testimony is to other people. Well, I'll just give them the gospel. Yeah, but you'll be like Lot trying to pull his, his son-in-laws out of God, Sodom and Gomorrah and said they mocked him to scorn. Why? Because he was vexed, righteous, his right, righteous soul vexed daily by their wicked deeds. Your testimony matters. My testimony matters. When people see us, when they observe us, and they say, well, is that the God I want to serve? Your testimony, it still matters. I said this earlier, but you cuss and chew and run with those that do. You should never do that. Why? It's your testimony. Holiness is still expected. I already said that. I won't preach on it. 
But holiness is still expected. Your testimony. You say, I lost it already. Ask God, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit so I can teach others thy way. Hey, guys, ladies, gentlemen, church, your testimony, it still works. It still works. Tribulation, truth, the temple, your testimony. Number five. Talking to God still works. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Little girl said, Dad, I want to do this. I'm going to play softball. And uh, Dad said, no way. There's no way. Okay, it was me. All right. All right. There we go. All right. So forget it. Well, my daughters wanted to play softball, and I said, there's no way. $4 gallon gas. We're not driving that thing. She said, well, I'm going to pray. I said, you can pray all you want. <laughs> there's no way. Well, I'm still going to pray. I'm like, well, good, because it moves mountains. About a week later, I wasn't even... When even a message, I mean, it would have been pretty awesome if God would have got on a radio and I was listening to preach a message and he would have said, Will, let your daughter play softball. I would have been like, well, I guess that's an answer from God, right? He preached at me. I just wept. And I said, are you kidding me? I, you're not supposed to move my mountain. I'm a proud no. And everything in my fatherly instinct said, no way. You're like, you're talking about softball. I know, but a little girl wanted to play. And a big God made it happen. Why? Because talking to God still works. Talking to God still works. You can go to him at any time. You can call on his name. And Jeremiah says, he'll do great and mighty things which thou knowest not. But I've asked. I've asked for someone to get saved. I've wept at the altar of God. I have done that. Yeah, I know, but how many times? Because talking to God still works. With God, there's nothing impossible. Do you believe that? I turn around and ask myself if I believe that. And if I really believe that, why am I saying more to him? Because I'm telling you this, talking to God still works. Talking to God still works. Number six. Turning from sin still works. <laughs> turning, turning from sin still works. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. That means that when you know that you're under sin, when you know that God, the Holy Spirit, has got a hold of your heart, he's got a hold of who you are, and he says you need to turn from that, and you need to turn from that right now. When you turn from it, you'll never repent of turning from, God, turning from that sin. You'll never say, man, I'll turn from that sin and be like, but what'd I do that for? I'm going back to that thing. You may do it because you get coerced into it, but I'm telling you this, when you turn from sin, it works, and you'll never repent of getting away from the sin that will eventually destroy you if you don't watch out. Turning from sin, it still works. That word repentance is not preached a lot in churches. Boy, it ought to be. I think of this, uh, and I, I say this often to teenagers. I'll just say it to adults, too. When's the last time you repented of something? We say, well, I ain't got really nothing to repent of. Really? Wow. I'd like to shake your hand. You can get up here and preach for a little bit. Oh, come on now. I ain't really got nothing to repent of. That might be in your mind right now. Well, why don't you just ask God a little bit? He'll bring something to your memory. He'll bring something into your heart and your life. It may happen seconds ago. I ain't got nothing to repent. I'm telling you, turning from sin still works. Come on, turning from sin, it still works. Lastly, you ready? You said, yeah, please. <laughs> Number seven, telling the story. It still works. Telling the, the, just the gospel story. Acts 1.8 says, you've been witnesses unto me. Just tell the story. Uh, man in my office, and yesterday came in, grew up in a Jehovah Witness background. You know, Jehovah Witnesses, they do not believe Jesus is God. And I could tell this man was, he was versed in scripture, he knew his scripture, and I'm like, I'm sitting in the office, and preacher's not around. He needed help. And I'm like, I told him this. I said, <clears throat> so tell me your story. I just wanted to, you know, tell me your story. He's like, well, I was born, and I'm like, well, I didn't mean that far back, but go ahead. And I knew it was going to be a, 
long two hours. You know, it, was, it was about two hours we talked. I'm thinking, okay, but I, I have to learn a lot about him through that. And he just needed help, and he's broke before God. But I was like, man, what am I going to tell this guy? And God said, it still works. Just tell him the gospel. So I did. I said, but you got to understand something, because Jehovah's Witnesses say, oh, yeah, I'm saved through the blood of Jesus. And I said, now, wait a second. It's just so close. I said, but you got to believe Jesus is Jehovah. Oh, they don't believe that. I said, I'm, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you. And I said this, and I just gave him the gospel. I just said, Lord, here's some verses. And I said, would you like to pray and get saved? Truly. He said, yeah, I would. I said, just repeat this prayer after me. And it's kind of like what I said. He said this. Can I just pray? I said, sure. He said, God in heaven, by Jesus Christ, I accept you now as God. And he goes on to pray and talk about how he's broken and I just, God, I need you now. And he's just, he cried out to God. And I'm sitting in my seat going, I'm going to have a Baptocostal fit, man. I mean, <laughs> some of you are like, wait, oh yeah, I'm squ-. I'm like, dude, this guy's just lightening up, man. I love it. And we got done, and I took him, we helped him out a little bit, and I got my car, I dropped him off, and I got my car, and I said, man, that was awesome. It was just awesome. What did I do? Did I do something miraculous? I have a toy my I'm not going to convince you that Jesus is God. I'm not going to do that. I can do that. I said, it's a heart issue, not a mind issue. I said, but I know this, God wants to convince you. He has to. All I'm so told to do is tell the story. And guys, listen, listen, Bible Life Church. Telling the story still works. You don't have to fluff it up. You ain't got to add a new age to it. You ain't got to say, well, this Jesus is this hip dude. No, no. He is Jesus God, Jehovah God. And the blood of God has paid for your sin. It's simple. He died and he was buried and he rose again so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. That's a story. And telling the story still works. The old paths, hey, they still work. They still work. Every head bowed, never eye closed. Father, I thank you for your holy word today. God, thank you that you still work. You still move. I believe that. Through the preaching of your word, you still move. And hearts will be moved and minds will be stirred. And so in this moment of invitation where we invite people, oh God, would you be ever with the people of Bible Baptist Church today? I know we have a lot of wants and needs. We have a lot of heartbreaks and brokenness. We live in a broken world. And our prayer is only that you'd put us back 